Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. I just went over the big picture what Saul or Paul We'll call him Paul at this point. What Paul was trying to teach the church at Corinth was to be careful that they wouldn't go after evil things. Now, we went over why last week, because if you crave evil things, then those evil things, well, what's the wages of sin? Death. Death. And in each of the stories, we kind of summed up the paraphrasing the stories, going quickly over them. Spark notes, if you want to to think of it that way. We did the, the summing up of each story and we saw that every single one of the evil things they craved cost lives. There's just no way around it. Whenever there's a warning from the Bible that says, take heed. Look at verse 12. Take heed. Let him who, who thinks that he stands, let him who thinks he's got it together, take heed lest he what? lest he fall. There's a, there's a spiritual warning. Take caution. If you think you're so great, be careful. You're going to fall. The Bible says in the Proverbs, pride goes before the fall, right? It's, it's one of those things that you just, you got to watch out for. But the children of Israel, they craved a lot of different categories of evil. And Paul just like summed up a bunch of them, and I bet they knew the stories. That's why he didn't have to go into the... Maybe he even preached on them when he was there. So now he's just got to refer to them. Oh, don't forget about the time when, uh, you know, they were craving the evil in the, out there in the wilderness, you know. We don't like the manna. Now, we went over that one last week. The Lord goes, okay, I'll send quail for a couple days' journey, right? Three feet deep, and you'll choke on it. They actually did, some of them die from their, they, they, they called the place the graves of greediness. They were greedy. We, we have to be careful, you know, we can, sometimes we can have something really good in front of us, but we, we, we don't bridle our, our, our greed for it. We're just like, give it all to me, you know, and you only need it enough to eat. Not, not, not so much you're choking on it. And the next story that he went over is found in verse 7. He told us not to be idolaters. Now, this is a biggie. This is, by the way, the biggie in the scripture if you want to learn the Ten Commandments. What's the first commandment of the Ten Commandments? I am a jealous God, and thou shalt have how many other gods? No other gods before me. That's it. One is it. Yet, it says this quote, that it, as it is written, Paul says, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they stood up to play. Now, where did that happen? You guys probably know this story. I mentioned it last week. It was found in Exodus 32. In Exodus 32, the people of uh, Israel were following Moses. And Moses went up to the mountain. And Moses, it says, um, well, in the chapter it says, when the people saw, this is Exodus 32, verse 1. Would you turn with me to Exodus 32? I got a few little subtle things I want to point out in this story. You guys probably know this one already, but... But just in case, like a little, you know, revisit for you. It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, that they assembled about Aaron. And they said to him, come, make a God. Make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Moses is MIA. We don't know what to do. Who are we going to follow? I mean, Moses led us out, but now we're out here and we're at the base of this big mountain and he went up the mountain. He's been gone so long, we don't know what to do. Why don't you, Aaron, you're like the, the priest guy God chose. Why don't you make us a God? So, And now they, some of you might think, that's a silly thing to ask when they just had God Almighty deliver them. But remember, they had 430 years of slavery in Egypt. Their frame of reference is the Egyptian culture. Do the Egyptians have any different gods? And I'm not talking God Almighty. I mean, little g, not, not, 
not true deity, but they had their own little gods that they served. And, and they were used to this. And they're like, well, we, we're going to have to have somebody to lead. So Aaron, now I want you to pay attention to this part. Aaron says in verse 2, tear off your gold rings which are in your ears, the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Give me all those, those uh, marks of slavery. By the way, those earrings were put in as this is, uh, this is you're my slave in Egypt. So they put the mark of the certain gold ring in their ear. He said, give me all those. So they tear off their gold earrings and they give them to him. And, and it says in verse 3, and they, they brought them to Aaron. And he took them from their hand. And it says right here, look at verse 4, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, and, and, then, and then they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. What? Your earrings? I mean, your golden calf that wasn't even around but came from your earrings? Then Aaron saw this and he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now this is getting confusing. You got a molten calf made from the earrings, and you're going to have a feast to the Lord. So the next day rose, and they uh, they they rose they early, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the here's the verse right here, verse six, and the people sat down to eat, and to drink, and they rose up to what? To play. What did they play? Bocce? That's Italian lawn bowling. I don't think so. What are they playing? Checkers? Chess? No. This is the Hebrew word they rose up to play um, in the sexual arena of things, to, to fool around. And the Lord spoke to Moses, go down at once, for the people who you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. If they was playing checkers, he wouldn't be sending Moses down so quick. But they have turned quickly, it says, aside from the way which I commanded them, and they have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, this is your God. Notice it's a little g. Your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, they are obst an obstinate people. Obstinate means stiff-necked, stubborn. He says, now then, <laughs> listen to this. Now then, let me alone that my anger might burn against them and I will destroy them and I will make of you a great nation. Moses, step aside. I'm just going to basically zots them and we'll start over with you. And Moses, Moses entreats the Lord and says, Lord, why, why does your anger burn against your people whom you've brought out from the land of Egypt with your great power and with your mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying, with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth. Moses is actually playing advocate for the children of Israel who are doing evil. This is, this is um, by the way, Moses is, is referred to in the New Testament. He, he, he does the type of work that Jesus does for us. He intercedes for us. When we're sinning, Jesus intercedes, right, on our behalf as the as our advocate. Here's Moses playing the advocate for, for Israel. He says, Lord, the, the Egyptians are going to say you just brought us out of here to kill us. Lord, turn, turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Now, can you change the mind of God as a man? This is an interesting, you know, premise. Can you change his mind? So is the Lord willing to... to, to, to now, does he know the outcome already? Yes. So it's kind of cheating. But in our understanding, it seems like he's changing. Yeah, it says with God, there is no change. There is no yay and nay. He, he knows the answer already. He already knows what's going to happen. He says, remember Abraham, Moses said, and Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself that you said, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. Remember you said that, Lord. And, and, and all this land, which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So, so the Lord changed his mind, it says, about the harm which he was about to do to his people. And Moses turned, he went down the mountain, 
with the two tablets of testimony in his hand. The tablets which were written on both sides. They never show this in the, in the movies. The, the original tablets had the writing on both sides of the tablet. And who did the writing? Do you guys know this? Verse 6 says, The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. How cool would that be? To see God's handwriting in stone. I, I mean, I, we had a time machine. I want to get there before these things get shattered. Oh, oh, I forgot to tell you. They get, well, you know, they get to the bottom of the hill. Moses does, and he, he gets a little angry. When he gets there, he, he, he hears this sound in the camp. It, it, it sounds like the sound of war, it says, but then he listens, and it's not the sound of a cry of triumph. It's not the sound of the cry of defeat. It's the sound of singing like a party. And it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp, verse 19, and he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf which they had made and, and burned it with fire and ground it into powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel to drink it. Here, drink your God. Grind this little golden calf up into a in the, now, I've seen rich people when I was younger, they actually paid for this gold flake stuff that they would put on the chocolate cake and little curls. And, and people, were, oh, I pay so much for this. Ex I mean, it was ridiculous. It was that Mountain Shadows. They paid this exorbitant rate. They eat a piece of chocolate cake that had a real piece of, of this. It, it looks finer than cellophane. I mean, it was really, really fine little curl of gold. And they ate it. And I was like... You didn't just do that, did you? Like, that's a... Okay, but here in the Bible, these guys got to eat ground-up gold on the water. And then Moses said to Aaron, what did this, did this people do to you that you brought such a great sin upon them? What did he do, Aaron? He's asking Aaron, the priest, what did they do to you? And Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. You were gone, Moses. We didn't know what to do. So I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> now, I want you to notice when we read this... <clears throat> In verse 4, it says, He took from their hand the gold and fashioned it into a gr with a graving tool and made it into a golden calf. But when he told Moses the details, he left out the part about him fashioning it with a graving tool and just said, I threw the gold in and out popped the calf. What was I to do? Magic. Poof. This story makes me think, you know, you get pretty stupid when you want to cover up sin. I mean, I just read the part about David with Bathsheba and some of the stuff that men do. You just think, men get dumb when, when it comes to them covering. And even the priest, God's choice for priest, for the nation, gets dumb. Right now, he's dumb to me. I mean, he's going, <gasps> wow, I just threw it in and out it came. When Moses saw, saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron, it said, had let them get out of control to be a derision amongst their enemies. This is going to be a... This is going to come back as the enemies are going to look at. Look at those stupid Israelites for the foolishness that they do. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword on his thigh, Go back and forth from the gate to the gate in the camp and kill every man his brother, every man his friend, every man his neighbor. Did you know that this is in the Bible? So that the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. In other words, says, go kill the guys that are fornicating. And the Levites did it. And Moses said, dedicate yourselves to the Lord for every man has been against his against his own son and his brothers in order that he might bestow a blessing 
upon you today. And the next day Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I'm going to go up to the Lord, and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And Moses returned to the Lord. And alas, this people has created a great sin. They've made a, goal, a, a God of gold for themselves. But now, if you will forgive their sin, and if not, Moses says, please blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to him, listen to the heart of Moses. He's like, Lord, forgive them. They, they messed up. And if you don't want to forgive them, just blot me out. And the Lord's answer is very interesting. He says, the Lord says to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, that's who I'll blot out of my book. Not you, Moses. It's whoever did the, the deed. But go now and lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel will go before you. But nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Nice that you asked Moses, but, you know, like Moses like saying, put it on me, not on them. Does that work in the spiritual sense of things? Can we just say, oh God, give me the punishment not to, maybe you love someone and you don't want them to get the punishment for their sin. What's God say? I give the punishment for sin to the guy who's sinning. This is not, by the way, this is very sobering. It's very good, like pay attention here. Don't think you get away with it if you, because verse 35 says, then the Lord smote the people because of what they had done with the calf which Aaron had made. Which Aaron, it says, had what? Just popped out of the fire? Just accidentally, I just threw it in, out it came? Yes, which Aaron had made. God said, I'll deal with him. Now, back to Corinthians. Paul says, we should be careful that we don't become idolaters. We don't make an idol. As soon as you change your God for another God, God of gold in this case. But we would never do that. We would never worship money, right, over God. Funny, in the New Testament, Jesus has to talk about this in, in, uh, in Matthew's gospel. Matthew, by the way, was a tax collector. Is there anything to deal with money in the scripture? You hear some story about money. You went, which, which one of the gospels? I'm kind of lost. Luke was a physician. It has like a lot of details about healings and, and specific things about the bone and the hand withered and all. Just guess Luke if you're playing Bible trivia. Just guess it was in the Gospel of Luke. But it has to do with money. You're not sure. You're going to improve your odds if you guess Matthew. And Matthew writes, li listen, turn to Matthew 6 real quick. These are the words of Jesus, but Matthew kind of keyed in on them. Interesting, he would put this down for us. He heard Jesus say this. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24, he said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or riches. They're exclusive. you got to serve one or the other. You can't serve them both. Now, this is hard for some folks. They're like, but, I, but, but doesn't God want me to prosper? I heard that on the television. This prosperity preacher was telling us, God loves you and wants you all to be rich and have a Mercedes. And Jesus had six different houses around the Sea of Galilee and, and around Israel. And I said, that guy on TV is a false teacher because he just called Jesus a liar. And you say, why? I said, because the Bible says... Jesus' word says, The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has what? No place to lay his head. If he had six houses spread around Israel, he was lying. Jesus was homeless. I know that that's not popular to teach in American culture because we want the great American dream, everyone to get a house, you know, 2.4 kids or whatever it is, and the garage and the boat and the, you know, four by four and the Mercedes or whatever the dream is now. I don't know. I mean, to me, it's all materialism. And, you, you know, materialism, I, I know so many folks that have so much and they are not happy folks. Don't get deceived by materialism. Materialism, it, it, it has this, this weird hook. It, 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 it kind of curves back around and it always makes you never content. You get some more and then you're like, but but it's not the latest. You got the latest, greatest stereo with the biggest speakers ever made, and then next year there's a 
there's a new speaker with a quarter inch taller. You're like, mine isn't as good as it could be. You're like, how big does it need to be? You know, if you want to serve materialism, you're going to lead a life of great discontentment. But if you follow the Lord, like we went over last week, you can learn what Paul learned, the secret of being content, whether you have a lot or a little. And here, we're told, watch out. Now, Paul is given an admonition here. It's a warning. Take heed that you don't fall into the same sin what happened to... Now, this happened to Israel for whose example, verse 11? All these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom, it says, the end of the ages has come. This is written for us. That we don't go after gold. We don't go after money. We go after the Lord. If you seek God's kingdom, His righteousness first, everything you need, not, I didn't say everything you want. Be, let me be really clear here because there's a little subtle twist that the, that the prosperity guys are preaching. They're like, seek God and get everything you want. Where is that in the Bible? It's not. Seek God and you will get what you need though. Give us this day our daily wants. Is that what it said? No, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, you know the portion I need. Give me what I need. Now, Paul says, watch out. We don't want to copy their sin. We don't want to go after gods of gold and exchange the creator, the powerful one that delivers for a god that come out of a fire from scrap gold from our ears. I mean, that's foolish. Yet it says, look how quick the people's minds sunk into depravity. As soon as they exchange the creator for creation, they do stupid stuff. They start making offerings to a golden calf. And the next thing you know, they're sitting down to eat and drink. And the next thing they're doing, rising up to indulge the flesh. As soon as you exchange your creator for something in creation, I don't care what God it is down here, whatever you make into your God, you're going to get stupid. Don't get mad at me. It's just a, I'm just pointing out what he said. They rose up to play, and they're rising up to play. Got God pretty mad. And God dealt with them. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.